burglars, vampires, and sex games gone wrong. Cannibals and werewolves collide in a dark cave. And all the slashers from the 80s come in for a huge party. Did you notice these creepy connections? Throughout all three films that make up the Evil Dead trilogy and the TV series Ash vs. Evil Dead, creator Sam Raimi weaves in a number of references to iconic horror movies, the most notable being a direct tie-in to Wes Craven's A Nightmare on Elm Street. In a brief blink-and-you'll-miss-it moment, eagle-eyed fans can spot the iconic bladed glove of Freddy Krueger in the workshed sequence in Evil Dead 2. If that weren't enough, Freddy's glove also appears in a similarly small capacity in Ash vs. Evil Dead. Still hanging in the workshed when Ash returns to the cabin decades after the events of Evil Dead 2. According to Esquire, the explanation behind the appearances of Freddy's glove in the film and Raimi's TV series dates back to a friendly game of one-upmanship between Raimi and Craven. Noticing a torn poster for Jaws in the background of Craven's The Hills Have Eyes, Raimi decided to include a poster for The Hills Have Eyes in his first Evil Dead movie, as if to hint that Raimi's film was scarier than Craven's. In turn, Craven included a scene from The Evil Dead in A Nightmare on Elm Street, prompting Raimi to include Freddy's famous glove in Evil Dead 2. Now this is the sort of friendly banter and competition that fans love to see between filmmakers. Groovy. A Nightmare on Elm Street isn't the only horror franchise that the Evil Dead series ties into. In the ninth entry of the Friday the 13th series, Jason Goes to Hell, The Final Friday, the movie's director included several props from the Evil Dead films that seemed to connect his film with Raimi's horror series. In Jason Goes to Hell, items like the Kandarian Dagger and the Necronomicon Ex Mortis from the Evil Dead are prominently shown, with one character even momentarily flipping the pages of the Necronomicon. Rather than it being a a simple tribute like the inclusion of Freddy's glove in Evil Dead 2, the director of Jason Goes to Hell made it very clear that the link runs much deeper than a mere visual reference. In fact, it was his attempt at ensuring these two franchises would be linked forever. In an interview with Horror Geek Life, Director Adam Marcus said the appearance of the Necronomicon is meant to non-verbally establish that Jason Voorhees' mother, Pamela, read from the book in order to raise her son from the dead. As Marcus sees it, such an explanation helps provide a feasible reason as to why Jason goes from a young boy to an unstoppable killing machine by the second Friday the 13th film. In other words, he simply has to be a deadite. Marcus fully supports his self-created fan theory, telling naysayers it's now canon, and that's final. <laughs> Taking a more comedic approach to the slasher genre, Bride of Chucky is known for acting almost as an outright spoof of slashers than anything else, poking fun at numerous horror movies of its day. Slasher fans can spot any one of the large number of references the movie makes to well-known horror films. However, the most straightforward example of this being in the movie's opening moments. The scene in question finds Tiffany Valentine hiring a corrupt police officer to retrieve Chucky's remains from police custody. Venturing into the department's evidence locker room, the police officer passes several artifacts of slasher fame. These include Michael Myers' white mask from Halloween, Jason's hockey mask from Friday the 13th, and Freddy Krueger's blade-fingered glove from A Nightmare on Elm Street. There's also a chainsaw that may be the property of either Ash from Evil Dead or Leatherface from the Texas Chainsaw Massacre series. I think I prefer you like this. You're kind of cute. Sharknado is a horror series that falls under the umbrella term so bad it's actually kind of good. Consisting of sequels, prequels, spin-offs, and even video games and comics, the Sharknado franchise is known for its laughably poor effects, its over-the-top acting, and its endless supply of celebrity cameos. Like every entry in the franchise, Sharknado The Fourth Awakens is no exception to this latter rule. One of the minor characters to appear in the film is taken straight out of Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. The radio DJ best known as Stretch. Surviving her run-in with the cannibalistic Sawyer family, Stretch goes on to appear in Sharknado, once again played by Carolyn Williams, in a small but entertaining cameo appearance. By the events of Sharknado, Stretch has settled down, fittingly opening a chainsaw store with her friend, Chop Top, played by Dog the Bounty Hunter. The concept of a chainsaw store is an obvious reference to Williams' starring role in Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. However, the name of Dog's character also serves as a clever nod to the film, sharing his name with the member of the villain a Sawyer clan who menaces Stretch. 
Since his debut film, Reservoir Dogs, Quentin Tarantino has created one of the most layered filmographies of any director working today, mastering a range of diverse styles and genres. As drastically different as each of his movies are, almost all of Tarantino's films have been revealed to exist within one massive shared universe, known as the Tarantinoverse. In certain cases, the connections between Tarantino's films may be something as small, or they could be larger, such as a character who crosses over into other films. One great example of this is his Southern lawman, Sheriff Earl McGraw, played by regular collaborator Michael Parks, who appeared in several Tarantino-related films. Introduced in the Tarantino pinned from Dusk Till Dawn, McGraw seemingly meets his end at the hands of the fugitive Gecko brothers at the start of the film. However, the character went on to appear in a handful of other Tarantino films, including Kill Bill and Death Proof, as well as Robert Rodriguez's Planet Terror, meaning that each one of these films exist within the same universe. Does anybody know what's going on here? There is a major connection that places Joe Dante's The Howling and the iconic slasher franchise in the same universe. This connection can be spotted in Walter Paisley's Occult Bookstore, with the mummified remains of a woman spotted in the background. A more careful look at the body reveals that this is actually the corpse of Great Grandma Sawyer from the Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. As the mummy is spotted in a bookstore primarily dealing with the occult, it shouldn't be surprising that a notorious figure like the Sawyer's matriarch found its way into Paisley's macabre collection. More than likely, Grandma Sawyer's appearance in the film can be explained by the fact that the Howling production designer Bob Burns also worked on the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, likely using props he already had on hand from that film to stock Paisley's bookstore. Still, it's interesting to wonder what a universe where Leatherface battles werewolves and what the resulting carnage that would ensue from such an epic encounter would look like. In addition to its connection with Toby Hooper's The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, The Howling also happens to tie into another of director Joe Dante's works. In the werewolf film, a news anchor named Lou Landers appears briefly, seemingly named in part for the director of the Bela Lugosi starring The Return of the Vampire. In Dante's follow-up movie Gremlins, Lou Landers reappears in a minor capacity, this time reporting on the Mogwai invasion of Kingston Falls. The connection is a small one, but it's still interesting to see Landers appear in a manner that ties the two Dante-directed films together. Aside from Landers' appearance in both films, there is a small visual connection that further links Dante's two movies. In a small scene in Gremlins, a yellow smiley face sticker appears on the Peltzer's family's refrigerator. This can be seen as a reference to the calling card of Eddie Quist, a serial killer in The Howling, who leaves behind smiley face stickers at the locations of his past murders. It's subtle, but it's easily noticeable to fans of both films. Having fun? fun. In the decades following the release of Jaws, dozens of films have tried to cash in on that landmark movie's success by depicting everyday animals as uncharacteristically aggressive man-eaters. The most notable of these Jaws rip-offs is Joe Dante's Piranha, the movie that led to the director's meteoric rise in Hollywood. Receiving mixed reviews at the time of its release, the film went on to achieve cult status in the years that followed. It led to a sequel and two remakes, one of which was released in 2010 as Piranha 3D. Coming full circle with the undeniable influence of Jaws on the film, Piranha 3D opens with an elderly fisherman being devoured by a school of ravenous piranhas emerging from an underwater cave. Played by Richard Dreyfuss, the fisherman appears to be wearing an identical outfit to the one worn by his character, Matt Hooper, in Jaws. As it turns out, this was not an accident, but an intentional effort to establish the fact that Dreyfuss is playing the same character in both films. As Dreyfuss told Hollywood News, I play the older Matt Hooper, who escaped being being eaten by the shark and is now eaten by a bunch of piranha fish. Yeah, they're all gonna die. Filmmaker Mike Flanagan has cultivated quite an impressive reputation as a modern horror director, tackling several ambitious adaptations of Stephen King's work and helming some of his own equally entertaining original projects. A link between two of the director's best projects can be found in his 2017 Netflix thriller Gerald's Game, based on King's novel of the same name. In the film, the main character Jessie is left chained to a bed while getting intimate with her husband, who suddenly passes away from a heart attack. As Jessie searches for ways to free herself from her handcuffs, viewers can see a book on a shelf above Jessie's bed in several scenes. The book titled Midnight Mass is written by Maddie Young. Maddie is also the name of the main character of Flanagan's previous film, Hush. As if that weren't a powerful enough connection, the title of Maddie's book would even serve as a premonition for Flanagan's later effort, Midnight Mass, which is an excellent horror miniseries in its own right. You're so much smaller than I remember. 
director Neil Marshall is responsible for delivering some of the most vastly underrated horror movies of the past few decades, two of which include his wonderful werewolf film, Dog Soldiers, and his claustrophobic horror shocker, The Descent. As vastly different as the two movies are, they do share common threads that place them within the same nightmarish universe. The connection between the two films can be seen in The Descent, when the film's main character, Sarah, looks over the various skeletal remains of past meals devoured by the carnivorous creatures living in the underground cave system. In the scene, Sarah briefly scans over what looks like the head of a giant werewolf from Marshall's previous film, Dog Soldiers. In another minor scene in the film, Sarah picks up an old helmet with the name Oswald written across it that she finds in the underground cave. This serves as another tie-in to Dog Soldiers, referencing a close friend of that film's chief protagonist, Harry G. Wells, whom he reminisces about in the film. While Wells reveals that Oswald met his end via a landmine in the Iraq War, it's worth wondering if he'd maybe ventured into the same cave system shown in The Descent sometime before his gruesome demise. Perhaps that could be a prequel film idea for Marshall to consider.